So good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Harry. So today we are going to talk about this uh, absolutely fascinating story, which goes back more than five decades, of uh, the Apollo missions uh, after the moon landings. You know, they brought back some rocks back to the Earth, and those rocks were later found to contain iron crystals, beautiful iron crystals. Okay. So tell me how these iron crystals feature in the study that we have published. Well, these iron crystals are interesting iron crystals in the sense that they are very small iron crystals that you can only see by using te um, techniques such as scanning electron microscopy. They are of the order of one micron in size, so they're far less large than the width of a human hair to give you some feeling of dimensions. And so you have to use something like a scanning electron microscope. Fortunately, even in the early 1970s, there was chemical analysis facilities available in these, these microscopes and they were able to establish beyond reasonable doubt that they were essentially pure iron crystals. There was a, they could, you could argue there's a half a weight percent nickel, but essentially as an impurity, but it's essentially pure crystal. Yeah. I mean, pure uh, didn't they say that uh, the nickel figure was below the limit of detectability or something? They were covering their backs very nicely, as scientists should do, by saying that it was below the limit of detectability, which of course is a way of saying we can't exclude the possibility of nickel, but we think it's below this reasonably low limit. So, um, and that's completely different from the iron meteorites that one, one, one hears about, where the iron meteorites are, it is correct in the sense that they contain iron, but they also contain rather large quantities of nickel. Mm -hmm. And so you get these, what are called Wittgenstetten um, patterns or in these iron precipitates, but, but they're completely different in composition because they've got a lot of nickel. And these, the scale is very different. And the scale right? could be on the order of meters, for example, mm -hmm. in extreme circumstances. In examples you find in museums, they are on the scale of even um, 10 centimetres or so would be not unreasonable. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, at the Smithsonian, yeah. I've seen so, a meteorite uh, more than a metre. Well, that's with, quite impressive, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Um, but so these are, as, as we've stressed, one micron in size. So that's of the order of the wavelength of light. So that's why you have to use scanning electron microscopy mm -hmm. to be absolutely certain that you see these things. And when you do see these things in the scanning electron microscope, they have these very specific morphologies. So but that uh, first, of all, um, first of all, Kevin, uh, explain uh, where, in, uh, where, with respect to the rocks that were brought back, yeah. were the iron crystals well, found. So, so, the, so the, in mineralogy, the terminology is that they are crystals found in vogs, which are part of lunar breccias. So, in layman's terms, which you and I yeah, would be good to understand explain, yeah. better, well, it turns out that Brescia is the Italian for rubble, and so rubble is essentially a conglomeration of bits of different minerals glued together by some, some concrete-like species which helps to bind all the crystals together in this hmm. rubble. And within this rubble, there is, it's not in absolutely 100% um, dense, so there are holes, they call them vugs. We, we could call them cavities, <laughs> but let's call them vugs because it's mm. something which that means that, that, that mineralogists can differentiate, differentiate themselves from other people by <laughs> saying we know what that terminology is. Mm. Very useful for, for, useful for Scrabble, but once you work it out, it's basically small crystals found in holes or cavities in rubble or lunar rubble, which of course is very precious lunar rubble because it's come being transported back to the Earth from the Moon. Hmm. So and how, how exactly do these crystals form inside these vials? Well, they, they form from essentially a vapour, um, which will be containing iron, but containing other uh, chemical elements such as silica, such as oxygen. And it just so happens that the later stages of cooling, so you, you get the brushes, which are... When the, the other crystals are formed. They, they formed as well, and these... Um, iron crystals are the last crystals to form and they are excitingly interesting because okay so the crystal structure of these, this, these iron crystals is what's called body centered cubic iron so this is a so these are where the iron crystals pack together in a regular arrangement 
defined as body centre cubic. The atomium in Brussels, for example, is has a large uh, cube sculpture of um, BCC iron. Mm. Now, and so you might think that simplistically, you know the crystal structure is cubic, then they might form cubes. But they, in this case, they don't form cubes. You might also think they form other crystal shapes where the, where the pl external planes defining these crystals have got what are called low index Miller indices um, to do, and this comes back to the crystallography of, uh, of these little crystals. But these are unusual in the sense that you've got some of the faces are what I would call Q planes, and other of the are planes which in Miller indices are HHL. And this is different from what you see in very, very small iron, pure iron crystals found on the or found or produced synthetically on the planet Earth. Yeah. And so, then uh, so the crystals, uh, uh, you know, the reason why uh, crystals often have facets is because they're trying to minimize the overall surface energy. It's a surface so, energy problem, yes. So yes. do these moon crystals actually correspond to an equilibrium shape? They correspond to a very non-equilibrium shape in, in the sense that um, the shapes are represented, well, it have a combination of what are called in mineral indices 100 type facets, and these are the facets which are of the general form HHL. The, mineral, the geologists at the time working in the early 1970s um, in NASA just described them as HHL facets, and I suspect that they were just happy with that because it was a different morphology from what other um, people had seen on the planet Earth. And they said, yeah. look, we found something different. And they didn't feel the need to, as it were, go deeper and try to ascertain what the possible indices of H and L might be. So and that hasn't that. happened for the last and years. And, right? and by doing a careful literature mm. search, A, when we, before we wrote the paper, and B, informed by the referee's comments for the first, first draft, Fair enough, we did a further check to find out that actually the, paper, the original NASA papers had not been that well cited. And clearly where they had been cited, they were, people weren't just in the least bit interested in what H&L mm. might have, the specific facets. From the point of view of somebody who knew, knows a bit about crystallography, you could look at, the, look at the crystals, look at the scanning electron mic microscope images, and they didn't look as though they would be, say, 112 facets. They just, just didn't, didn't correspond to what you might have when you look at mineralogy or crystallography textbooks, such as F.C. Phillips' book on Introduction to Crystallography, which I myself had as an undergraduate when I was at Cambridge. Yeah, because they seem to have uh, planes with a high packing density. Of they all have planes. planes, so in what are called in mineral indices, the terminology 100 or 110 or 111, possibly 112, but exotic indices, look like the ones we actually feel that are there in these moon crystals, well these will form because of course the crystals, so it's a, there's an energy, energy minimization argument, but it's to do with the fact that the atmosphere within which these crystals form is some sort of soup of unknown composition to us, and it'll be minimum given that atmosphere within, within which the crystals form. Yeah. And uh, so, the, the sort of, um, if these crystals formed on Earth, they would very rapidly be destroyed by moisture and so on. That, that is very likely. So these are yes, actually yes, found yes, in pristine yes, condition, yes. aren't they? We can assume there's very little moisture on the Moon. This is one of these things where mm -hmm. there's a lot of speculation about whether there's any moisture on the Moon or, or Mars or any other planet of your, of your um, that you might like to think about. But the reality is, is that most of the the moon is going to be very, very, very low. Right. And the inside of the world as well, yes. these yes. cavities might have been closed, they, may, so. they may have been protected from any um, unintentional vapour around, yes. So basically these crystals look absolutely beautiful. You they know, look very beautiful the eye, that's and, right. and they are reasonably uh, uh, symmetrical. Some, some of the crystals, we analysed five crystals, but I think it was three of them that two of them look reasonably symmetric. That is to say, they have the external symmetry consistent with that symmetry of a cube, cube. that you can, um, with which people are familiar. Which people so, are yeah. called M by 3M. 
which people call M bar 3M, where it's got four-fold axes of symmetry called tetrads, three-fold axes of symmetry called triads, and two-fold axes of symmetry called dyads, yes, mm. to use Very the good. technical nomenclature, yes. Yeah. So, um, how do you go about discovering what these HHL indices actually oh. are, given, oh. given the uh, limited information that we have in terms of, uh, you know, micrographs published by NASA? So what we were having to look at were the five freely available micrographs um, published by NASA. When I say freely available, well, one of them is easily available as a web link to that. Two others are in literature or in journal papers, and we had to take very high resolution uh, scans of those images to persuade ourselves that that was the best quality in which we could use the analysis. So, but the problem is, you know that the faces that you're trying to index are going to be of the form HHL, and you might think, well, okay, let, let's assume, and we know that L has got to be greater than H, that's another limit boundary condition. The conditions under which the micrographs, the scanning electron micrographs are taken, it's a reasonable assumption because of the magnification used in the, because they're one micron in size, it is a reasonable assumption that it is what's called parallel um, projection. projection illumination. Yeah, because we are working so, with two dimensional <coughs> images. Because essentially what you're looking at is a two dimensional um, image from a three dimensional object. So, and you have mm -hmm. to try to use proje essentially projectional geometry. And it, re it is relevant whether the parallel projection assumption is a useful and relevant because that makes, them, that makes the um, the geometry far more easy. That's right, um, because if it wasn't a parallel projection, you know, uh, it would be like a perspective, so distant objects yes, would be further away, like and effectively you are distorting the... So, uh, and people in material science are hopefully nowadays reasonably still happy with the concept of stereographic projections, which are which is where, where the central projection is nothing like infinity at all. So it's the south pole of a, a sphere, for example. Mm. Um, so, so in a sense, we are lucky that we can approximate this. Aspect. So essentially, these are. This was a d very defensible and reasonable approximation, and it's the, the the approximation you really, really want to use, unless there was a compelling argument not to use it, and it turned out there wasn't a compelling argument yeah. not to use it. So let's go for it. Yes. Yeah. So that was the first part of the puzzle. The second part of the puzzle is that, well. These crystals are five-sided, which actually you think oh five-sided. Uh, the, the faces are. Sorry, the, sorry, the faces of the crystals, um, the ones which are not obviously 001 type or one or 100, are they've got five sides to them. Now you can dismiss straight away anything to do with icosahedral symmetry. The five sides reflect the fact that you've got a 100, you have 100 type facets and HHL facets. That's very straightforward. You, you, could, you could actually make uh, the whole crystal with just the You HHL could make facets. something which is something icosahedral, yes. Yeah, and it would um, have uh, 24 faces, each face uh, yeah. shaped like a kite yeah. with uh, yes. two sets of sides. Of, you, you, you could. Uh, different and, it, and they'd be of, of Yes, you could, but they would be of the form 1 tor 0, which is not the same thing. Right, right. Where tor is 1 point, is square root of. Root 5 plus 1 all over 2, 1.618034. Yeah, and that uh, the, yep. the 24 sided object is what you call uh, you know, deltoidal icosite tetrahedral. This, partic this particular, when it's the HHL fasting, it's the deltoidal um, icosite tetrahedral. Deltoidal icosite tetrahedral. And that's the term terminology used by Phillips. And uh, the O1 planes basically truncate that. And the O01. And that's why we get the five truncate. sides, which, yeah. Is, yeah. which is what, uh, yeah. uh, which is the puzzle that uh, inspired the uh, yeah. yeah. study. Yeah. So, so, so that's how you get the five sides. You then realize that every HHL face has got nearest neighbors, which obviously, and, the, and two faces meet in a line. Mm. So that then determines the vector directions of those five lines are the parallel or anti-parallel vectors and you can make it quite general that if the um, face is a, of an index HHL and one of its surrounding, um, one of the adjacent fa faces is, is let's say H 
bar HL, you can work out what is the line corner to those two faces. Mm. And you can do, do that systematically so to define the, um, the vectors which define those five lines. And then you have to say, well, okay, so imagine that we're, this parallel projection is along the dire direction UVW, UVW, and then we can work out what the vectors, well, the, what those five vectors would appear to be like Looking in projection down. down that UVW direction. Mm -hmm. So we can then use that to work out the angles between, angles seen in projection between those the five vectors defining the face of that crystal and we can do that for actually not just one of those faces but all the, of the all type of HHL and it is not enough to just look at one face and hope that your measurements are so spectacularly accurate that that in and of itself will define the uh, indices. indices of the HHL and that you can defend your choice of UVW. It turns out that for two of the crystals where the symmetry really, the external symmetry really was the same as the M bar 3M symmetry for a cube, actually you could you can use the again the project from the projectional geometry, you can work out a very good idea of what the UVW direction must be because it because of the symmetry of what the, the any crystal will look like when seen along a general direction UVW. That there's a little bit of mathematics which works out where that direction would have to be on that projected image of that crystal. And that's quite, that, that's quite useful as a, a check. But basically, what I ended up doing was doing lots of Excel spreadsheets over the Christmas of, the, just after the Christmas period of December 2022, and my partner at home was thinking, well, what, what's he doing all this for? You know, so it's essentially, you can look at this as being like a Sudoku puzzle. You know, you like to solve a Sudoku puzzle. And so I, I actually then developed a program for, so that you could, for any eight values of reasonable values you might want to look at for H and L, you could see what the crystal would look like in, under a particular projection mm -hmm. choice UVW and compare it with what you see on the image. Yeah. And, and of course, um, uh, you, so you're not just comparing how it looks, but also the angles uh, you're, measured on the you're, micrographs and so on. You're looking at the ang you're looking at all the information available, well, essentially all the information available in the scan electron microscope mm -hmm. image. So what faces are almost parallel to the electron beam? What are slightly off being parallel to the electron beam? In addition to the ones which are clearly not parallel to the electron beam and are looking at you, as it were, mm -hmm. as you look at them. And it's not so. It's the totality of the information. So you're, you're, and so that is why, when it came to the analysis, and we were also making the reasonable assumption that all of these crystals found close to one another, why would surely they'd all have the same value of H of L because of the environment in which they were were uh, had crystallized? So that's not that's again a reasonable assumption. They look similar, so perhaps they are similar. Mm -hmm. So when it came to analysis, we found, well, we tested various faces. So the possibility is like 116, but it clearly wasn't 116. 115, 114, oh, they looked pretty good, and there were some subtle differences between the two. Sometimes one looked better, sometimes the other looked better. But if you, said, if you took 229, that was quite a sort of reasonable compromise and defensible compromise. At the other extreme, something like 223 or 112, clearly not. No, yeah. It was entirely inconsistent with that. But 115, 114, 229 is a sensible compromise. So you could argue that we're um, hedging our bets by saying it's 229. But the subtleties between 115 and 114, you could argue that, well, perhaps that's going back to this parallel projection um, assumption wasn't quite as good as it could have been and if somebody wants to come along and look at our data and say well actually let's tweak that parallel po projection approximation and come up with either 114 or 115 as the definitive answer well at least we'll have led them sure. pretty much along the right path to the correct solution so and by also analyzing Crystals which weren't perfect, where uh, which were which had uh, different sizes so of all one one crystal had one particularly large facet, or one facet, for example, mm. 
um, we could actually again reproduce what the images would look like in the absence. One or two, two crystals had clearly other crystals attached to them as well, blobs. I right. Right. No, so they looked like blobs. Yeah. They looked like blobs. Um, but and then one crystal was elongated in one particular along one particular direction. And if, again, you, with a bit of vector algebra, a straightforward vector algebra, you can analyze this and again come up with projectional geometry um, images of what these crystals would look like under assuming the facets were particular mm -hmm. things and assuming that the projection direction was again one which you could defend as being reasonable. Um, <clears throat> and you use the same projection direction that you was your best estimate for those, all those different geometries. So I should so, add that uh, yeah. all, so, the, all this analysis, including the uh, algorithms, are actually available on the web. Yes, yeah, so I, I sent those to you by yeah. email and you put them up on the, on the web. And if people like ploughing through Excel... Yeah, because they're yeah, actually quite interesting. And you can play yeah. with things, play with this, the, uh, the data as well, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's all out there. So, um, um, <coughs> Kevin, um, let's assume that uh, you know, the analysis is absolutely correct due to nine. Uh, why would nature choose to have well, it such a crazy set of indices? Well, it comes the back to the, to the unknown impurities in the atmosphere surrounding the iron crystals when they were growing. It's as simple as that. It turns out the mineralogists are very happy to, to basically say, mm -hmm. well, it's to do with the impurities uh, surrounding... But there the are other environment. studies on other crystals where impurities have been shown to result in and indeed, high yes, index yes, uh, yes, planes. Yes, yes, uh, so yeah, yes. Is there any other uh, reason why this might be a high index uh, plane? Well, the, the, with high index planes, the nice thing about high index planes is they can replicate one of themselves quite easily because they are going to be composed of, let's just say, steps and ledges. And because you've got these defects between the steps, well, the, the step ledge interfaces, that can help to propagate the same low or high index plane. Makes um, it easier for atoms to deposit. And it makes it e e easier for atoms to deposit, to deposit. But ultimately, the thought that the, the the step would be the dominant plane which would form. Hmm. And in this case, if it's of the form HHL, you might naively assume that one one two might be a low energy facet. Or, um, but actually, we see that it's so you could have one one two type facets, no one type facets. What are one steps causing these macroscopic 114, 115 planes? Yeah. Um, it, it is uh, common in growth it, it, theory. It, it, is, it, it is certainly common as part of the growth process, but usually you find that ultimately at the end of the growth process, the, the, surf, the external morphology is dominated adjust. by adjust so the, the low energy in, in planes are produced. But as I say, in geology, the very fact that they find all these different forms of the same mm -hmm. crystal, they're quite happy with it. So, Kevin, a, good, a second example would be iron pyrites, for example. That anybody who's ever been to a, um, a mineral shop or business no, case, okay. you find there are lots of them are cubic and they're 1001 type facets. But there are also the more interesting varieties of iron pyrites crystals, which you which you can purchase, which are two or no facets, which are icosahedral like. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Kevin, uh, just to finish up, yeah. uh, you know that uh, NASA is uh, planning more missions to the moon and even to establish a moon base. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Wouldn't, it be, uh, wouldn't it be exciting if you could ask them to bring us some pristine iron crystals so that we can subject them to you know, modern analysis techniques yes. and yeah. close problem. It would be, yes. Mm. And um, gosh, it's over 50 years since man, and it, it, of course it was an American. There are 12 Americans who mm. have set foot on, the moon? On the, foot on the moon. Very popular pub quiz question. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there are only 12 American men who have uh, who've stepped on the moon. Um, it'd be nice if we could have technology which allowed that again, yes. Yeah. And again, it's one of these things where it comes, ultimately comes down to money. Uh, um, yes. Well, they are, so, you know, they are going to establish a boom base, so it would be easy to go and pick up some of these rocks, <laughs> I assume. Okay. I assume so. And, of course, it would be nice 
equally to do this on other planets such as Mars, but there again, mm. getting to Mars and having a, 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 somebody land or step foot on Mars, that's a challenge. But funnily enough, uh, the Mars lander has collected samples and mm. left them there for the next lander to come and pick. Yes, because they can't bring them back. Yeah, yeah. So, and I don't really know what's happened, what's happened mm. with their analysis at all, but that's actually good that they've something has landed on Mars rather than crashed into mm. it and actually we can get samples. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Right.